we're going to transition from mics here for a minute, but um, while we're doing that, um, somewhere Friday night, I got the cold everybody's talking about and been getting. And so uh, I am sick today. <laughs> I have tried not to shake any hands as I've been here. So if I have touched you, make sure you sanitize and all of that stuff and don't touch anybody else. Um, I started getting sick Friday night and basically uh, just had a head cold and so on through uh, yesterday until about 5 o'clock. I got up, got out of bed at 5 o'clock, felt pretty good. So I'm about 75% back to normal, but probably still 100% contagious. So, so I will uh, vacate the premises as soon as uh, things are over. So don't, don't expect me to be social today. Um, we've got a couple things we need to take care of real quick. Number one, I'm going to flip back to that slide just before. Uh, go ahead and hand in your communication sheets to these aisles right here. And if uh, some of the ushers would pick those up, I would appreciate it. We're doing this now uh, because I have something else at the end of the assembly. So go ahead and turn those communication sheets in now. If for some reason you have a prayer request that comes up and you want to write on it later, just hand it uh, to some one of the brothers at the back door there. Uh, Jack is usually back there. Hand it to Jack. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask for three more volunteers, and that would be um, uh, Crystal, Edson, and Amy. If you would take these sheets and hand out, one of you take a section. Edson, you take this section right here. Amy in the middle section, give one copy to each person. And uh, that, that is part two of the message. The message has three parts today. Uh, so just take a sheet. Don't even worry about looking at it right now. It'll help us go through part two. Uh, and so uh, it will be very helpful to us when we get there as we hand those, those out. So a couple of weeks ago, I introduced um, three, um, three uh, message series of lessons and on worship and uh, the, the message a couple of weeks ago was the best form of worship when I was growing up as a young Christian I learned that there were five forms of worship in our assemblies and there are I'm not in disagreement with that <clears throat> whatsoever <clears throat> but one of the things that happens and this is something else that I also learned in my youth was that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Old Law has been done away with and we're under the New Law. On, on the flip side of that, Jesus said he didn't come to do away with the Old Law. <laughs> Interesting. He said, I came to fulfill it, not to do away with it. So I understand what we mean when we say the Old Law was done away with. Uh, uh, Hebrews uh, explains pretty explicitly that we're not under law, we're under grace and other places in the scriptures. Thank you for handing those out. Um, but we do an injustice to ourselves and to the scriptures when we divorce ourselves from the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament has uh, the foundational principles upon which many New Testament principles are also uh, continued and built. For example, uh, the best form of worship in Micah 6.8 was, what does God require of us? Does he want lots of sacrifices? Under the, under, the, under the law, it would have been animal sacrifices. Does God want a lot of animal sacrifices? If, if he's asked for a few sacrifices, should I give him thousands and ten thousands of bulls? Would that, would that please our God? God has asked for all the sacrifices to be seasoned uh, or to, to be sprinkled with oil, olive oil. So if God wants olive oil on some sacrifices, should I give God rivers and rivers of olive oil? Would that make God glad? And Micah said, no, listen, man, this is what God wants from you. Micah 6, 8. God wants you to act justly, walk in mercy and walk in uh, love mercy and walk humbly with him. And then, if that weren't enough, the other prophets repeat that. Hosea repeats that. And Hosea says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And if that weren't enough, Malachi repeats it. And Amos repeats it. Several of the prophets repeat that concept. Even Jesus in Matthew, I believe it's 9, says, haven't you heard? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And so, and so we need to realize that while the Old Testament law, of course, were not under law, 
We're not under any, any law for that matter, much, much less the Old Testament law. Uh, we're led by grace. And really the commandments are summed up in two, love God and love people. Uh, and that's what it's about. But when we divorce ourselves, we don't catch the, from the Old Testament, we don't catch the principles. And that principle is very important. That principle of the worship that God wants is for me to walk humbly with Him, to act justly, do the right thing, no matter what, and love people, love mercy, extend mercy at all times. That is exactly what God wants, both Old and New Testament. That is worship. That is the purest, best form of worship. And what Jesus criticized the Pharisees for doing was they had all the right form according to the law, but they didn't have the principle that was from the heart. And so we would end up doing the same thing as the Pharisees if we came together in our assembly and had all the right five forms, but we walked out of here without the heart. We would be exactly like the Pharisees, not having the best form of worship, which is to walk humbly with God all the time, do the right thing, no matter what the cost, and love mercy, extend mercy to people. That's the best form of worship, both in the Old and the New, New Testament. And so today is a text a lot like that, Romans 12, 1. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And we will need to define some Old Testament principles before we're able to understand this scripture. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I want us to focus on this word, therefore. Therefore, this is the NIV. What you have in your hands, probably, I believe is, uh, it may be from the, the English Standard Version. Uh, and I think it starts out, I urge you, brothers, therefore. But the, the word therefore is extremely important because this is a point of change in the book of Romans. Therefore brings to mind everything he's already said in the book. And I'm going to quickly just run through some things that God has already said that explain this therefore and in view of God's mercy. He's already extended so much mercy to us. In chapter 1, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of salvation for everyone who believes, Jews and Greeks, absolutely everyone. There's no difference between for God. Jews and Greeks all have access to, Jesus, to, to, to Him through Jesus Christ and the good news that comes through Jesus. And in chapter 17, he says, because uh, it's written that, that, we, that, that, that the just will live by faith. This gospel is from faith unto faith. That's from Habakkuk 2 verse 4. An Old Testament passage, but Paul applies it in Romans 1.17. He says this gospel is from faith to faith. It starts out by faith and it continues by your faith in the provision that God has given. And then in Romans chapter um, 3, he says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And around verses 23 and 24, he says, But God has given His Son as an atonement, a sacrifice of atonement, and payment for our sins, that all who have faith in Him and in His payment for our sins will be justified, will be given forgiveness, irrespective of if they're Jews or Gentiles. All who have faith in Christ will we'll have forgiveness. And in chapter 4, he says, does he give that forgiveness? Does he give that right standing with God because of what, what people do? Because, because of their actions? Because of their works? And he says, no. In chapter 4, he says, not even Abraham got it when he, when he, when he, uh, because of his works. In fact, in fact the, the, the forgiveness to Abraham was given even before he was circumcised, before he could actually do anything. And claim that uh, he had done some work to earn it. And then he says in, in chapter 4, verses about 6 and 7, look at David. And he quotes an Old Testament scripture. Blessed is the man to whom God will not put on his account his sins. And what did David do? What, what was David's big sin? Who can remember that? Call it out. Who, what was David's big sin? Adultery. And what else? Murder. And he uses David and says, because David was walking in faith, blessed is David. God didn't even write on David's account that he was guilty of murder and adultery. Wow. It's not on David's account. Blessed is that man to whom God does not write on his account 
the sins that he has committed. Wow, that's amazing. Why did God not attribute to David, write those on his account? Because he was a man of faith and walked by faith. That's the kind of grace God extended to him. God extended him forgiveness and righteousness, not based on what he did, but based on the flow of his life and the faith in God in the flow of his life. And in chapter 8, I love chapter 8. Chapter 8 obviously comes after chapter 7. And in chapter 7 of Romans, what do you find? You find a man, Paul, who is saying, oh, what a miserable man I am. Everything I try to do right, I do it wrong. And everything I try not to do, that's what I end up doing. And he ends up at the end of the chapter, uh, chapter 7, saying, Who shall deliver me from this wretched body that I am in? And then guess what he says? Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. At the end of chapter 7. Who's going to deliver me from this wretched body? The more rules and laws out there, I try to obey, I don't obey them. And the, and the things I'm told, the, the prohibitions given to me, I try to avoid, I end up doing those things. Who will deliver me from this wretched material body that just keeps falling into sin? And he says, the only thing that can deliver you is Jesus Christ himself. Thank God for Jesus. And in chapter 8 says, therefore there is no condemnation for those that are in Jesus. Christ. Amen. There is no condemnation. Not for David, not for Abraham, not for any sinner who comes to God by faith. And now we know it's by faith in Christ and His sacrifice. There is no condemnation for us. The gist of Romans 8 is that God has done everything and is doing everything for us because God wants us in heaven with Him. And so as you go through Romans 8, the, the, the emphasis changes from the Son to the Spirit and all the things that the Spirit is now doing for us. And so, in, uh, before we get to that in verse 4, I always like to point this out uh, regarding, uh, regarding what Jesus did for us. Dying on the cross, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You can either walk according to the flesh and be thinking about always doing enough works to please God. And the problem with that scenario is that if you start telling God the good works you do and try to convince God that you need to earn salvation because of what you do, then God not only takes into account the good things you do, he also looks at the other side of the ledger and looks at the sins you commit. So if you want to go before God on the basis of your works, your record, just remember, God doesn't only see the good works, He also sees the sins. Who wants to go before God on that basis? Thanks be to God that in Jesus Christ, in our faith in Him, we completely fulfill the requirements of the law. And the requirements of the law are sinless perfection. And so when God looks at those who have faith in Jesus and live their lives by following Jesus, what does he see? He sees perfect, sinless creatures. Why? Because that's what Jesus achieved for each one who believes and walks in faith in him. We get perfect, the perfect identity of sinlessness. And that's why when we come together as Christians, it's probably not that fitting that we just go on and on and on and talking about how much we sin and how we're just sinners before God and how God, we just so much in sin all the time. It's probably not that great of a deal to do. Number one, the apostles don't do that. The apostles, whenever they write letters to the Corinthians or the Ephesians, they call them saints. And obviously he says you need to correct some things, but they don't belabor and belabor and call, call them sinners. Even the Corinthians who were practicing some sin, he calls them little children. You need to grow up, become mature. But he calls them saints to start with. And so we do deal with sin and overcoming sin. But God sees us as fulfilling the law when we have faith in Christ. 
And that's the only way it can be done because Jesus did. Uh, and so in the rest of Romans 8, I'll just say it really quickly because I'm spending more time on it than I wanted. But he'll say in verse 28, even even the things that seem bad, God uses all things for our good. He uses everything for our good. Even when we suffer, God even uses those things for our good. Why? Because he wants us in his presence. What shall separate us from the love of God? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who will condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all of these things, even if it's a sword that pierces us and takes our life, all of these things simply usher us closer to being in the presence of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is expressed in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he concludes in Romans 8, in Christ, we have no condemnation. And in Christ, there is no separation. Romans 8 says God is on our side. He's wiped the ledger clean. No sins against us because of our faith in Christ. His spirit helps us pray. Even in adversity, those adverse things, adverse things he uses to bring us closer to him. Nothing will separate us from God. Therefore... Since God has done all of that, since he's been so merciful, how should we respond to him? That's a good question, isn't it? I'm going to take a little break. Now I want you to get out your papers. I'm going to take a little pause from that thought. And I want to give you some foundation from the Old Testament and then we'll wrap it up. The reason I'm doing it this way is because... I chose three Old Testament sacrifices, which I think will help us understand this terminology. But first, I need some help. So I'm going to ask Edson, would you help me again? Would you move those three chairs against that door and that wall? So we're going to make, we're going to design the tabernacle right here. I want you to use your minds to think about the tabernacle. In the tabernacle of the Old Testament, there was a courtyard, and we're going to let this be the courtyard. And the worshipers would come into the courtyard more or less where these chairs are and would meet the priest about right here, one of the sons of, of Levi, of Aaron's uh, lineage. And the priest would meet the worshiper right here and receive the offering. From here forward, then the priest would take that offering. And we're going to let this uh, lectern represent... The, the altar of burnt offerings. There was an altar of burnt offerings, and on each corner of it, there was a horn. On the four corners, it had a horn. Those horns are very important. This is the burnt offering altar. And as you proceed it forward, from here forward, you would now be in a tent. And this would be called the holy place inside of a tent. The worshipers could not see inside of this tent. They could, they could approach only to where those chairs are. They could see what's going on at the burnt offering. But from, from here that way would be a tent. And inside this tent there were several things in this holy place. There was a lampstand. Um, there was another altar called the altar of incense. And the altar of incense was right before this huge curtain. And so this wall represents the curtain that divides the holy place from the most holy place. In the most holy place, there was an ark, a, a box that contained the tablets of law. And over that, there were two cherubim with their wings symbolizing, protecting us in mercy uh, uh, between us and God covering us from that law. In any case, inside this most holy place, the priest did not go on a regular basis. Only once a year, the high priest would go in there. Inside this most holy place was the representation of the pure glory of God. 
If a priest dared to enter there when he wasn't supposed to, he would be struck dead immediately. So most of the work of the priests was right here inside the, the holy place, not in the most holy, and in the courtyard here where the burnt offering was. But right here, as I mentioned, there was another altar, an altar of incense on which incense was being burned continually up to the Lord. And on this altar of incense, there were also horns on each corner of the altar. And so in the first offering that I've written for you in Leviticus 3, I want you to get out a pencil or a pen or something to write with just to circle some things. It'll help you understand the flow of what's going on as we go through these. Pencil or pen... Crayon, doesn't matter, something, highlighter, whatever. Poke your finger right with your blood, whatever you want there. Be good. We just want you to make a mark on here. So Leviticus 3, the peace offering. There was an offering called the peace offering. The focus of the peace offering. Every offering had a different focus. The focus of the peace offering was not like if you're a husband and you mess up, you got to take flowers to your wife and make peace. That's not it. It's not to uh, expiate sin. It wasn't like that at all. The peace offering was an offering of gratitude or trust or celebration. For example, Hannah, when Hannah asked for a son, she was barren and she asked for a son and God gave her Samuel. When she went to fulfill her vow in, in gratitude to God and show him I'm fulfilling a vow, I'm so grateful that you gave me my son. Now I'm bringing my son to the temple or, uh, to, to be trained and, and work in the temple. When Hannah did that, she took a peace offering. So peace offerings were to show gratitude or to fulfill vows. They were to, they were to show that you were celebrating uh, something good in your life that God had been faithful to. And so it says if the offering is a sacrifice of a peace offering, if he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his head hand on the head of the offering. Right over here. So Hannah would lay her hand on the offering. The worshiper would do this, not the priest. And kill, cut the throat of that animal at the entrance. And then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. So circle the word blood and sides of the altar. In a peace offering, which the focus was just, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, thank you, Lord. The animal's offered, the blood is collected, and the priests throw it against the sides of the burnt offering altar. And from the sacrifice of the peace offering as a food offering to the Lord, he shall first, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that's on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that's on them and the loins and the long lobe of the liver he shall remove with the kidneys. All, the fat was always removed and burned to the Lord. It was never given to the people. And so the, the organs are taken out. And then it says, Then Aaron shall burn it, the offering, the animal, the body of the off offering. He will burn it on this altar, on the top of the burnt offering. So he burns this offering. And subsequently, what happens with that offering is Hannah, the priest, people that are around, they eat that meat. It's kind of a celebration. It's kind of, it's kind of a party. That, from that offering, they eat the meat. Now let's look at the next offering, the sin offering in Leviticus 4. The focus of the sin offering was forgiveness, was atonement. It's different than the peace offering. So watch what happens with the blood and watch what happens with the body. Again, the whole, if, in this case, if the whole congregation of Israel sins, in Leviticus 4, what it does is it, it goes through this this chronology, it says, if a priest sins, and it gives the instructions, and then it says, if the whole congregation sins, and then it says, if a leader sins, and then it says, if a common Israelite sins. And so I, I've, chosen, I've chosen the second group, the whole congregation, but it's the same format for all four groups. But anyway, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they do any of these things that the Lord's commands uh, have told them they ought not to be done. And they become aware of their guilt. 
when the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bull from the herd, that's a sin offering, and bring it in front of the tent of meeting. And the elders, in this case, the elders represent the congregation, and the elders are the ones who bring this animal and kill the animal and then hand it to the priest. And from that moment forward, notice down in uh, the end of verse 16, the priest shall take some of the blood, circle that, the priest shall take some of the blood into the tent of meeting. Circle that. Just bypasses the burnt offering altar altogether. Just goes right into the tent of meeting. And it says, and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. In front of this big curtain. What's behind the curtain? The Lord's presence. This is the sin offering. Notice what happens with the blood and the sin offering. Forgiveness is prominent. Seeking forgiveness, seeking expiation for our sins is prominent. And so the blood is sprinkled right up in front of that big veil on, on the other side of which the Lord's presence is. And they also take some of the blood, verse 18, he should put some of the blood on the horns of the altar. Circle that, on the horns of the altar. That's in, in the tent of meeting. Not the altar, the burnt offering that's outside the tent of meeting. On the altar that's in the tent of meeting, puts blood right up on top of the horns. As the incense is burning up and prayers to the Lord, this blood is put on there to ask for forgiveness of our sins before the Lord. The placement of the blood in these Offerings in the Old Testament is significant because when it's about sin, it's much more prominently displayed on the altars and on the horns of the altar. If it's splashed up against this altar just on the side, what does that tell you about the peace offering? The main focus of the sacrifice is not forgiveness. The blood was splashed up on the side. But in the sin offering, the blood is taken right before the curtain of the presence of the Lord and put on the highest point of the horns. And it's even sprinkled in front of the curtain because blood and forgiveness was prominent in this sacrifice. And then in verse 19, all of the fat he shall take from it and burn on the altar. So he takes the fat and, and, uh, from the animal and burns it on the burnt offering altar. Then notice what he does. This he shall do with the bull, as he did with the bull of the sin offering. So he will do with this. And the priest will make atonement for them. In verse 21. And he shall carry the bull outside the camp. He already burned the fat, potentially also organs. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But he burned parts of the animal here, the fat especially. But then he carries the bull outside the camp and burn it as he burned the first bull. It is a sin offering. So the whole bull, after the fat is burned, after the blood is offered on the altar uh, of incense inside the tent of meeting, the whole bull is carried completely outside the camp. And burned. Why? It's a sin offering. It's not a peace offering. A peace offering, they burned it on the altar of burnt offering and they shared a festive meal. But this is a sin offering. This is weeping. This is seeking God's forgiveness. The whole bull is taken outside the camp and burned outside the camp. And that's why it says in Hebrews 13, I believe about verse 20. That Jesus had to die outside the camp as our sin offering. Just as the sacrifice for sin, the bull was taken outside the camp and burned. Jesus went outside the camp and died. And then we're urged to go out to Jesus and bear the same shame that he bore to receive that forgiveness. Because Jesus was our sin offering. And then in the third case, where it says Leviticus 1, the burnt offering. The focus of the burnt offering was consecration and dedication. Notice what it says about how to do the burnt offering. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he'll offer a male without blemish. 
He'll bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. There is atonement. There is forgiveness. But forgiveness is not central.